As our opening official keynote, Alex Stamos. Alex, we appreciate you coming down to visit us. He's the VP of uh, Yahoo, also the CISO. He leads all aspects of information security, including the team of Yahoo Paranoids. You might tell us what that is. He's a well-known expert on internet infrastructure, cloud computing, and mobile security. And he co-founded ISEC Partners. Alex, let's give him a round of applause. Hey everybody, thanks for having me uh, in this awesome location. It's nice to not be doing a keynote in a shitty built-in ballroom. Uh, this is a lot, a lot more pleasant. Um, my name is Alex Summers. Uh, like Richard said, uh, I'm currently at Yahoo. Uh, before that, I'm a consultant and stuff like that. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about, since it's an AppSec crowd, how uh, AppSec is eating security. So this phrase you probably recognize as me ripping off somebody else. Uh, it's a ripoff of Mark Andreessen. Uh, one of the founders of Andreessen Horowitz. Uh, these are uh, probably my, the richest people I can call my friends uh, would be Mark Andreessen and Ben Horowitz, not through anything cool, uh, just because they hired me at LoudCloud and then they kept on firing my bosses until I became the head of security there uh, and not replacing them. Um, and so I get to do a lot of work with Andreessen Horowitz these days and uh, see them talk. And, and Mark has a, a, a saying that has been pretty famous since it started in Andreessen Horowitz that their key thesis is that software is eating the world. And what they mean by that is that there's pretty much no industry in the world, in Mark's belief, that isn't going to be disrupted by software. That right now in 2015, it, it feels like we're already living in the future, but realistically we're something like three or four percent of the way through the information revolution, because the vast majority of our lives and the vast majority of industries on the planet have really not changed to, to the fact that software can allow you to make more intelligent decisions, can get rid of um, dumb human mistakes uh, and can uh, you know make things much much more efficient. Um, the impact on this in the tech industry means that things are becoming much more generic, and a lot of intelligence is moving to software. So one of their theories is that people who sell things like dedicated pieces of hardware are toast. People that sell things that all they do is one thing are toast. That everything's becoming a platform, and that hardware is becoming a platform, and that new functionality is going to come out of software. And I think that's completely true for the security world. Um, if this is true, if software is in the world, then it means our subfield, AppSec, is going to be by far the most important area of security for the next 20 years. And that's kind of a bad thing because AppSec kind of sucks, honestly. We're, we're actually pretty bad at it, right? Like, we're really bad at building secure, dependable, safe software. Um, certainly, we're way worse at it than building dependable networks um, or dependable hardware systems. Um, and so, while this is a huge opportunity, it, it's also a huge problem and something that we're going to have to work on. Um, one of the, the facts I like to talk to people about when I do these keynote like thought leadership things, uh, do you feel led in your thought yet? Um, hopefully you will by the end, uh, is I like to talk about how you know the vast majority of companies in the United States and probably worldwide, honestly, but we'll just talk about the U.S. right now, are kind of screwed. Um, so if you look at the Fortune 500, I, I recommend you go do this because it's a really interesting, you just go to fortune.com and you click on the Fortune 500 button, and you go through the list of 500 largest publicly traded companies in the United States by market cap. And, you know, especially in the first 50 or so, there's a lot of recognizable names, right? There's the GMs and the Chevrons and the Exxon and a lot of people. But you start to get into two, three hundreds, and there's a ton of companies you've never heard of. Um, and if you go through and think to yourself, and I did this, um, who here is doing an okay job of security and who's not? you start to realize there's about 100 companies in the Fortune 500 that are doing an okay job. Now, this doesn't mean these people are totally secure. This doesn't mean they're not going to have breaches. These are people who can at least play the game in 2015, right? Every Fortune 500 company has international uh, competition. Every Fortune 500 company in the United States has a competitor in a country where hacking is seen as just part of the business process and where it's perhaps not state-sponsored, but certainly its state looks the other way. Right, uh, where uh, the, the state has sponsored and created a huge skill set for its hackers who can then go work for private industry and provide a competitive advantage against their Western counterparts. And so there's 100 companies, I feel, that are doing an okay enough job to play in that area. Um, these are obviously the big banks and the FIs. Um, some of the big banks have over 1,000 security people. Now, obviously, they're not all super highly skilled. A lot of those people are because their infrastructures are so large and sprawling. Um, but still, with 1,000 people, and with a you know, $150, $200 million product budget, um, you can probably do an okay job. 
Uh, the defense industrial base, because they've been dealing with China and Russia and everybody since the moment they had computers hooked up to a network. Um, the oil and gas industry. Uh, anybody here ever hear of the marathon oil hacking? Yeah, nobody. Which is amazing, because it's one of the largest actual thefts of, of dollars from um, the U.S. economy in history, but we all read about Target and the 100 million shitty credit card numbers that anybody cares about, right? Um, marathon oil... Uh, about, I think, this is like 2008, 2009, was looking for new oil and gas leases off the coast of Indonesia, I believe. And they spent all this time mapping the, the, the floor and doing seismic surveys and doing test drills and stuff. And then they went to the Indonesian government saying, we want to bid this amount of money for these plots. And it turns out Sinop, the Chinese national oil company, bid on those exact plots for the minimum bid more than what Marathon did. And they thought, wow, this is, what a coinky thing, right? This is... We didn't see them, you know, out there mapping the seafloor. Um, and it's amazing that they have complete overlap with the exact ones that we wanted. So they do an investigation. It turns out the CFO had malware in his laptop, and they're reading his email, right? So that is a multi-billion dollar swing of value for Marathon Oil to CNOC over a 50-year period, right? Um, but unfortunately, in the security industry, we just give a shit about things like credit card numbers and stuff. We don't think about the things that actually have an impact on people's lives or on, uh, you know, world politics for decades. Um, but the oil and gas industry certainly realizes that. They do a really good job. Critical infrastructure folks, I mean, we all know that SCADA systems are kind of crappy, but everybody knows that who runs them. And so they have done a reasonable amount of work to get them off the network and to do basic things to protect. Um, big tech companies like uh, us, Facebook, Google, you know, uh, the Twitter, the big companies that have the ability to build big, diverse teams that perhaps are not spending a huge amount of money but are able to build solutions. Um, and then some retail. I mean, obviously most retailers are in trouble, and that's what we've seen in the last year. Um, but there are a couple of retailers that have not been in the news, and if you talk to their security teams, you can understand why, because they're actually quite good. Um, but that means that there's 400 companies left in the Fortune 500 um, who aren't able to play the game, right? Like, these guys are still sometimes in trouble, right? Like, if you're in this area, you're still going to have breaches, and you're still going to have to work every single day um, to keep your system safe. These guys can't even play the game. Um, you know, for example, in my ISAC days, we did some work for a, a company that makes industrial equipment. This is a multi-billion dollar company. They employ thousands and thousands of people. They are a very important, uh, at least in their state and their local economy, a very important player. Um, they had like three security people, right? And they had competitors in a country where, again, they looked the other way. Um, and they had a, you know, classic corporate network intrusion that they were completely and totally uh, not qualified to fix. Uh, or or to, to respond to, not even qualified to figure it out. They only figured it out because somebody else found the control channel and notified them that they had malware um, in their network after they took over the control channel box. Um, when, when we tried to, I mean, we were able to help them fix up the initial bug, and we were able to help them, uh, you know, clean up some of the mess. But in the end, I really had nothing to tell them, right? Because if you're a mid-sized uh, industrial company in the Midwest, you're always going to miss three things that are critical to play the game in 2015. That's secure software engineering, secure AppSec. I mean, every single Fortune 500 company is writing their own software, right? Um, every single Fortune 500 company is a software vendor, uh, at least for themselves. Um, and the vast majority of them don't know how to write secure software. Um, they're, they're all mostly missing engineering-focused incident response. So maybe they're able to hire incident responders, but they're people that know how to use NCASE and FTK and don't know how to do things like uh, a query across to dupe to track an attacker moving through your, horizontally through your network, um, or people who know how to write code to make memory forensics faster, right? Like, if, if you want to play at the speed at which our attackers are playing at these days, you have to have instant responders who are actually software engineers who think instant response is great, not people who um, went into the Army at 19, took a test, did really well, and got six months of instant response um, uh, you know, training. Um, and then spent, you know, the Iraq war kicking in doors and, and imaging people's hard drives. There's a lot of guys like that with good skills, but they're not the kind of skills you, you always need in a situation. You might, guys might know which company I'm talking about when I'm talking about that company. Uh, there's a consulting company that will give you those people for 400 bucks an hour. Um, and then the ability to create their own solutions, not just buy them off the shelf. Um, most popular bot solutions are useless against advanced attackers. So we used to be a huge FireEye customer, and we're ripping them all out. We, we didn't renew. And which makes total sense. I mean, we found a bunch of malware from advanced attackers that just floated right past FireEye. Because there's a lab in Beijing with 20 FireEye boxes, right? Like, you'd be an idiot to be a nation-state level attacker and to use malware that FireEye catches. 
Um, and so, you know, there, there's a kind of a catch-22 of people, especially in the corporate world, who are trying to find malware that's used across multiple companies, um, that once you're popular and successful, uh, there's no way your product's going to work anymore, because as long as your product can be purchased um, by somebody who has a link to one of these governments, or one of, your, or one of the people who are actually hiring the hackers that are going to break into your Fortune 500 company, um, it's, it's no longer going to work. Uh, we all know users aren't safe. I mean, the, the unfortunate truth is that for the vast majority of people on the internet, they're only safe at that moment because they're not being attacked at that moment, right? Like, the only reason anybody's safe using the internet is there's not enough bad guys, which is a really bad state of affairs. That's, like, not a scalable solution of just we hope the bad guys don't figure out how, that, how profitable this can be. Um, and, you know, it's starting, this is starting to become a realization. This was a story in the New York Times Sunday Magazine about a, the reporter had her mom's machine taken over by crypto wall, uh, which went and encrypted all of her files. It's a fun story to read because the mom goes and like, it's her travails trying to buy Bitcoin out of a Bitcoin ATM, um, and then Bitcoin price drops. So by the time she deposits the money, it's not enough money. Um, and so she has to file a ticket with the crypto wall customer service portal, and they end up unlocking her machine anyway, because uh, they felt nice. And they're like, <laughs> yeah. they didn't want this poor lady in the Midwest to be responsible for Bitcoin price fluctuations. Um, so, uh, one, I have to say that's, you know, good job Crypto Bowl guys on having an excellent customer service reputation. Um, I'm not sure if they're using Salesforce or not, uh, but it's a possibility. Um, but, you know, we're, we're starting to jump the gap where this is going to become an existential issue for the tech industry, where, you know, every single person in this room is carrying around a device that, you know, if you told George Orwell, in the future people will carry around devices with microphones, trackers, uh, an always on radio connection that can connect back to their government. Oh, and they'll pay for it themselves, and every night they'll plug it in to charge it to make sure. Or well, say, that's crazy, I can't put that in TV4. I'm gonna go with the TV on the wall, right? Uh, that, that watches you. Um, and, you know, the, this is only because people have an assumption of privacy and security that's actually not based on fact, right? And so if, if we as the tech industry want people to continue to use technology and to integrate into their lives, we have to solve this and we have to catch up with people's expectations before their expectations get reset to reality, because once they're there, it's going to be really hard to fix it. Um, so security hardware is becoming unviable. These are the only slides I've, I've recycled from my Black Hat talk, so if you saw me at Black Hat, I, I apologize. Um, this is uh, the most expensive switch you can buy from the recent networks. Who here has used the recent hardware? A couple people, right? So it's really popular if you work at big, big companies. Arista makes very fast, very dumb switches. Um, their switches are a response to Cisco and other switch manufacturers throwing all of this intelligence into a switch. When an Arisa switch takes an Ethernet frame and a port and it puts it out of the port. That's like all it does, right? Um, it does it really fast. Um, and so this is the most expensive one you can buy. It has 1,152 10 gigabit ports. Uh, that 30 terabit per second of backplane. So while it's not non-blocking between all those ports, that's pretty damn fast, 30 terabits per second. This is the most expensive firewall you can buy from Palo Alto Networks. Now, I'm putting Palo Alto, Palo, Alto, uh, Palo Alto up here because they're actually my favorite firewall company. I think this is the best firewall you can buy today, and this is the most expensive one you can get from them. Um, it's about, it's actually the same size as the Arista switch. You can do 120 gigabits per second of layer 3 security throughput. That's not with all its features on, that's with some of its features today. Okay, so let's say we're building out a new data center, a new data center for a company that does a lot of cloud computing, um, or that does a lot of uh, uh, data crunching that requires high internode bandwidth, right? So like Hadoop, for example, requires a huge amount of internode bandwidth, and, and uh, if you want to build a performant Hadoop cluster, you want all those machines to be on 10 gig ports, or possibly multiple 10 gig ports. And so we buy one or reason to switch, and then we hook it up to a thousand Hadoop machines. Now, let's say I want to provide security services between those thousand machines so I can see if there's east-west movement by a bad guy or that one of these guys calls out to the internet or something funny happens. How many pallets or firewalls do I have to buy to provide layer three security without blocking the switch? Uh, reasonably close, 250. I have to buy 250 pallets of firewalls. So I get my data center, I put the switch in, and then I build another data center just for my firewalls <laughs> next door. <laughs> and I run the fiber optic cables. Um, and then this takes five kilowatts, uh, and then you're burning 600 kilowatts, so the amount of power of like a small subdivision, of a, of a suburban subdivision, just to power your Palo Altos for this one cluster, right? So clearly for anybody that operates at scale, this is a completely ridiculous idea that you can buy security hardware. This is the best security hardware you can buy, basically. You can't get anything more expensive than this. Um, I, I don't even want to know what the cost is of buying. I mean, you, you certainly make some Palo Alto sales guys day, 
uh, to be called, uh, and you ordered this. Um, when you told your, your CFO that you're paying for 600 kilowatts just for security for one cluster, that's where you probably get fired. Um, as, as a lot of you guys know, who here works at a large-scale company? Facebook, Twitter, Google. Yeah, so all of you guys know that actually our number one cost in many cases is power, right? If you look at the 10-year amortized cost of a data center, including the land, the building, all the cooling equipment, and the computers, still the majority of the cost over 10 years is the power that you put into it, unless you have some kind of really cool power deal. Um, uh, and so, you know, 600 kilowatts is never going to be within your budget to spend, even if you have the CapEx to buy the machines. Um, and so, I mean, the, the, the truth is, is that most security hardware has this problem. It's that uh, internode bandwidth has gone up. The, the, the necessity for internode bandwidth has gone up significantly in the data center, but security hardware is not being able to keep up. Um, and partially, this is kind of a weird Moore's Law versus network uh, speed kind of problem. Partially, it's that these companies aren't really thinking about it. Um, and they're still thinking about these kinds of devices only being something that does north-south security. Um, uh, partially, it's just that this is just the, the future of securities that will no longer be able to buy hardware devices. Um, I would not buy the stock in any company that sells hardware security companies, uh, hardware security devices for right now, that's for sure. Um, because as we'll talk about in a second, there's really no way they can keep up with the, the current growth. Um, another thing that's affecting AppSec and making security devices useless is containerization. Um, so who here has deployed software in a container? LXE, Docker, Rocket, oh, a decent amount of people. Right, so we have a big push at, at Yahoo to move to uh, Docker containerization instead of moving to OpenStack virtualization and get off of, of bare metal machines. Um, this doesn't really look good in this low contrast projector, uh, but basically the idea here is this demonstrates in a standard virtualization environment like OpenStack or VMware, um, what you have is uh, you have your, your hardware, you have a host operating system, and then you have hypervisor equipped, hi, uh, hypervisor software that helps host a guest OS. Now, this is obviously a super simplification. Modern processors have all kinds of hardware that help with the hypervisor, uh, the VTX instructions and such. Um, and so there's a bunch of holes actually pop through the host OS and the hypervisor here. Um, but this is the basic model. And then you have a guest OS, so you have a full standalone OS upon which an application is built. Um, and in that guest OS, you now need all of your libraries uh, and support binaries and stuff that your application needs to run, which depending on what platform you're using, if you're using like Node.js or Rails, that can be a whole crap load of stuff that needs to be in the operating system environment before it can, it can work, right? Um, this is one of the reasons I love Go, because you can just compile everything into one 200 megabyte binary um, and move it around with, you know, SCP. Uh, but, you know, most people don't write code in Go, uh, and so we have to support the idea of them having tons of library dependencies. Um, in a container world, you take the application in those libraries and you create a user space um, file system that doesn't have its own actual operating system, doesn't have its own kernel, and the security is being provided by the uh, isolation mechanisms in the Linux kernel. Uh, now, I've heard the Docker security model uh, described as aspirational at this point, um, that, uh, which is probably accurate because we are you know, a decade into the hypervisor world and there has been a lot of good work and research into making hypervisor secure. There's been a lot of work by Intel and in creating CPU functions that help make hypervisor secure. Uh, but I think in the long run, Docker is going to win. One, because people hate to have these guest OSs uh, with a huge amount of state. This is a huge pain because you have a, a machine with 10 machine, uh, guest OSs on it, you have 10 times as many machines to manage, right? Um, the, the other is that this, the, doc, the container world really works in the DevOps kind of model. This works great when this guest OS is, is operated by somebody who's different than the person who writes the application. Um, but if the same person is doing both, then there's no reason why the creation of those libraries and putting all those binaries um, into the application should be done by the same person who actually wrote the code themselves. Um, and so in the Docker world, or Rocket or LXC, you know, this, this, I'm talking about containers overall. It doesn't matter which container format you use. Um, we have no virtual sound card, right? So this is one of the reasons I think Docker will win in the long run from a security perspective. Um, is that the Linux kernel API is actually a lot simpler than all the crap a hypervisor has to simulate, right? It's like, why am I emulating a GPU for my Ruby app? Why am I emulating a serial uh, console? Why am I emulating a sound card for my server, right? And so that's a huge amount of attack service. It's a huge amount of C and C++ code that's pretending to be a low-level uh, hardware device that can act, create a huge amount of attack service. Um, and so the, getting rid of all that crap is great. Now, obviously, the C groups and all the other stuff in Linux container world have not been battle-tested yet, 
And we have the problem of Linux core holds spending a decade not caring about local privilege escalation bugs, and now all of a sudden he does. And so we have a, we have to kind of go back and fix all that stuff he didn't really care about. Um, but in the long run, I think the ver I, I, I'd much rather have a uh, Linux syscall interface to protect um, than to protect something that's emulating a, an Intel South Bridge, right? And all of its complexity and being bug compatible with the Intel South Bridge. Um, you have no guest OS patching. So if you have a container and you want to patch it, uh, let's say it's Shellshock, right? Let's say this container has a PHP app in it, and that PHP app calls out to the shell to do a bunch of stuff. And so it has a bash binary. Instead of patching this OS and rebooting the host, and then patching this OS and rebooting the guest, what you do is maybe you patch this host, maybe you don't. Um, and, you know, Shellshock, almost certainly the binary would be there, although there'll be a lot of stuff. You can... In a container world, this host can be actually much smaller even than a hypervisor. You can cut it down to almost nothing, a kernel, a NIT, a shell, libc, and a couple other things um, to run a couple daemons, an SSH, um, to manage it, or a chef or something. Um, and so you just redeploy the entire binary. Now, that means that there has to be no state here. That's one thing we don't see here is there's no storage of state locally in the app. Um, but the benefit is if you build your app that way, that all the state is stored in a distributed database somewhere, um, uh, or some kind of other di uh, distributed data structure or in a queuing system or something, then it's super fast. So you don't have to patch the SOS and patching can be much fast, faster. Now, we don't have VTX enforcement, so all that great work Intel's done um, in adding uh, support for hypervisors is useless in the container world. Um, so I feel bad for those Intel engineers who put their entire career into that uh, and then software left them behind, but that's how life is. Um, uh, you have no network controls. So, while, in theory, you can create virtual adapters and attach them to Docker containers, nobody does that. In reality, almost always what happens is every app in Docker runs under the same IP address as the host. The host might have a control interface and then a, uh, an app interface, but almost nobody goes for all the work of to create virtual adapters down here. And so the result is, in a containerized environment where containers are moving around all the time and they're jumping through IP addresses, you have no ability to provide layer 3 security using devices unless you have a extraordinarily flexible SDN system that nobody's ever bought before, right? Um, and so realistically, these Docker networks are just flat layer two networks with a huge amount of bandwidth and no layer three security. Um, you have no stable naming because of the same thing. The whole idea of containers is you can expand and contract them, so you always have to have an ability to figure out what machines you're talking to, either through like a queuing system or some kind of service registry. Um, and you have no one-to-one -one service relationships. Um, so in the long run, this is a really good thing for AppSec because it means AppSec is taking over responsibility for system uh, security as well. And so we no longer have the system administrator kind of and the production host people responsible for the OS, um, and then the developers responsible for the security of their stuff. All of that messy stuff in the middle, the shell shock, the heart bleeds, all of the stuff that's based in the build, uh, that's built in the basic libraries that cause a huge problem for patching because you have to coordinate these two teams that are two life cycles, goes away, and that all becomes a problem of the application development. Now, the downside is application developers are totally and completely unprepared for this. Um, and the standard kind of patching life cycles and companies are totally unprepared for this. And so if you're going to containerization, you need to build a whole new system to, to do that. Um, we have the Internet of Things um, that we're, we're all going to have to deal with. Um, as a lot of you have probably heard of SkyMall closed. Uh, and so if you're, if you're uh, sad that you can no longer buy um, a robotic uh, kitty litter box that cleans itself, uh, I totally recommend you go to store.idevices.com, which is really like the internet of SkyMall devices, right? It's all the crap from SkyMall, except now they all have Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, and a 18-month-old Linux kernel will never get patched. Um, which again, this then means that everything in the Internet of Things network is all about app security. There is no product you can buy to keep these devices secure on your network. Um, and probably most of you, if you go back to your enterprises and you do an audit of the, you already have a lot of Internet of Things things working, all of your environmental control systems, your power systems, um, all of those things are, are embedded systems that are never patched and that generally need unfettered internet access because they're calling out to some HVAC vendor or to your, you know, a company that's giving you a, uh, your energy green star and all that crap. Um, and so you, you already have this problem, it's just now we're exporting it to, to users. Okay, so what, what do we have to do if AppSec's going to eat the security world, if all these things are gonna happen, what has to happen to AppSec so we can actually live up to the things that we're supposed to do? Um, so apps have to be secure by default. I know people say this all the time, but, but you know, we need to get to the point of when a normal developer writes a web app, that that web app is safe. Not a normal developer writes a web app, and then they buy a web application firewall, and then they hire a consultant for $100,000, and now the web app is reasonably safe. 
Because the number of companies that do that, again, are only the secure 100, not the screwed 400. Right? Like the, the number of companies that will go through all the things right now you have to do to build a secure web app is vanishingly small and is not uh, reflective of, of the diversity of companies that have to write software. Um, and so one great example of how we've totally failed in this, something that was a huge opportunity that we've completely fallen down as an industry, is all of the JavaScript libraries. So who here has written something with AngularJS um, libraries like that? Yeah. So um, there's all these JavaScript libraries, uh, and a lot of them come with some server-side components uh, to help you work with them to, to build your, your front-end JavaScript much faster and a standard method to handle all your civilization and stuff. And so uh, one of my favorite current research teams in web app security the Cure 53 guys in Germany went and did a study. Let's look at all the most popular ones of these and let's see what they do for the security of the web app. Um, and so you can go to their web page here in their Google code and their wiki. Um, and it turns out all the most popular uh, uh, apps totally make your uh, um, JavaScript libraries totally make your app less secure. Right? Like this last column here is does the framework allow you to use CSP? Right? Content security policy is one of the best attack service minimization tools that have ever been invented in web app security. And if you want to use, if you just write your web app using one of these, except in one uh, situation, you cannot use CSP. It's just broken. And if you use CSP, you have to use it in a way that actually doesn't provide you any security because these guys are doing all these crazy avowals uh, and inline JavaScript and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so, I mean, the problem here is that developers already don't understand security. Um, and now that they've in, they certainly are not going to be at the point where if they import these libraries that they're going to understand the kind of security risks that they've imported for themselves. Um, and this is just not, I don't have a, a solution here. I mean, this is something you can solve on a small basis for your company by making sure you go out, you pick a library that does the best here, and then you try to find controls, mitigating controls for all the things that fail, or you have to write your own patches and create your own patch sets. Um, but honestly, most large enterprises, it's impossible to get developers. This is like, you thought the OS wars from the 90s were bad? Like the religious uh, lineup of developers to each of these JavaScript libraries is spectacular. Um, right? Like, you know, you'll, you'll have the, the Ember JS Jihad, uh, you know, attacking with Nerf guns against the Angular people. Um, you know, uh, it's crazy to try to get developers to agree on one JavaScript framework. Um, and so if, if you can just get them to do that, then maybe you can understand what your security flaws are. And then you can also you know, put stack code analysis in place to see what people are misusing it. Um, but for the most part, this is a, a huge fail um, because we had an opportunity here to, to do really good and, and we didn't as an industry. Um, AppSec doesn't have to be real-time or inline. So there's this idea in application security that we adapt from the network security world that everything we do has to be inline that if you have a security product in your software or hardware, you have to put it in front of your web server, and all of its detection has to happen in real time. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the, how realistic it is for that. There, it turns out there's actually a trade-off. I mean, that sounds like a great idea. Like, hey, I don't want to let any attacks through. I think that's a great idea for it to be always in line and always secure. But you have to realize there is a trade-off of if you're that fast, you can't actually be that smart. So a uh, 10 gigabit Ethernet port, which is the standard thing on web servers these days, any reasonable cheap-ass Dell box can saturate a 10 gig Ethernet port with a, a, a small web app, a simple web app. Um, means that you have 67 nanoseconds between different Ethernet frames coming in. This is the standard right now. In five years, we're all going to be buying 100 gig per, per second Ethernet frames, which means you get an Ethernet frame. By the time that Ethernet frame ends, there's 6.7 nanoseconds elapsed before the next Ethernet frame ends, and you have to look at it. So is there, is there anybody in this room, I saw a very tall man, anybody in this room who's six foot five or taller? Here. Okay, sir, can you stand up here in the middle? How tall are you, sir? A six eight. Six eight, okay, great. So you're perfect for this example. So why don't you look at your shoe? Okay, great, you can stop looking at your shoe. So how fast is the speed of light? In meters per second. It's 299 million meters per second. So how many meters does a, does a photon travel in one nanosecond, one billionth of a second? 0.299 meters. So in 6.7 nanoseconds, that's how long it took from a photon to bounce off of his shoe and get to his eyeball. In vacuum. It actually took a little bit uh, uh, longer because it went through air. That's how fast 100 gigabit Ethernet is. So think about that. A photon hit his foot and bounced into his eyeball, 
And this is light, it takes eight minutes to get to the fucking sun, right? So like, it moves pretty fast. You can sit down, thank you, sir. That's the distance it travels, so just about six foot five, two, 2.01 meters. So if you want to build a security product that moves this fast at 100 gigabit per second, that means that you have to look at the Ethernet frame and make a decision of whether or not you're going to let it go past. By the time that light travels six feet down the fiber optic cable, that you're coming. That's ridiculous. If you have a 4 gig, uh, gigahertz processor, that means you have about 28 cycles to look at that Ethernet frame. Um, so let's say you have a GET request that fits into a single Ethernet frame, so you don't have to reassemble it, and you want to decide whether you're going to let that GET request through. You have 28 cycles. Let's say the TCP's all been done, all that stuff's offloaded onto an FPGA. You just get a GET request already pulled out of the TCP frame in RAM, you now have 28 cycles to figure out whether to let that get request through or not. 28, and you know, these are like 28 basic Intel instructions. If you do anything that gets that isn't in the register, if you go to layer layer one cache, that takes up four cycles right there. Right? So you basically have to make the decision based upon 64-bit and 128-bit uh, registers, like uh, SS, uh, SIMD registers, what's in there, and 28 instructions. How intelligent is that? It's not intelligent at all. Right? Like, you can't do anything smart in 28 cycles, and that's where we're going to have to be. Um, this is from Imperva's website, and I can make fun of Imperva because they're in the top right corner of the Gartner chart, so that means you can make fun of them, right? Um, uh, you know, they, they try to advertise that all their stuff is in line and it's wire speed. And there's absolutely no way that you can provide any security on an application layer at wire speed at 100 gigabit Ethernet. Um, and 100 gigabit Ethernet's not that rare. We've got 100 gig Ethernet all over the place. Uh, not really the servers, but on a uh, component basis, and certainly we have a lot of servers that have multiple 10 gig ports. Um, so while your company might not be doing it, if you're able to operate at web scale, 100 gig Ethernet's no big deal. Uh, and that's where you know, our industry's going to have to be in a couple of years. So why is it a bad idea to do it in line? Like, so what I, you're like, oh, well, Alex is saying, I'm just going to let the attack go past, and I'm not going to make an intelligent decision whether or not to stop an attack from happening? Yes, that's what I'm saying. Because realistically, in AppSec especially, you know, we, we very rarely have the SQL slammer problem where you have like a single UDB packet and then all of a sudden you're screwed, right? Generally, an attack in AppSec takes multiple seconds, multiple web requests, it takes a little bit of time, and often it's a, a problem that you can unravel later, not in real time. You don't actually have to stop it in real time. Um, so here's an example of making a decision in real time versus later uh, that has caught a lot of people in the last couple weeks. Um, so who's this? Come on. Tom Brady, yes. The best quarterback of all time. So let's say in real time, I'm trying to decide whether Tom Brady's cheating or not. And I look at this picture in real time. This is a picture of Tom Brady not fumbling the football. What does that tell me to watch one play of Tom Brady play? It tells me nothing. Tom Brady didn't fumble, right? Everything must be fine. That's just normal. That's how life is. That's how football is. But if I wait a little bit, and I put a lot of data together, what you find out is that Tom Brady's a cheating bastard, right? <laughs> uh, this is a graph of the number of plays between fumbles for the entire NFL since 2010. This is from a great foot uh, uh, a football analyst named Warren Sharp, who runs a site called Sharp Football Analysis. And you can see that these, here's the, the linear progression line, that you know, a little bit under, a little bit over, all these teams, the, the second best team here is Houston, this is Atlanta, and then this is the Patriots. So completely ridiculously off the charts that obviously something funny is going on, right? So this is the decision you can make in 6.7 nanoseconds, and this is the decision you can make if you're taking all that data, you're putting it into a big data database like a Cumulo or something like that on Hadoop, or you're looking at it uh, via Apache Spark, and then you're deciding whether or not something funny happened later, and then you're, you're reacting to try to fix the bug later, um, which is a totally reasonable thing. Because often in the web app world, some bad guy finds a bug, and then they actually exploit it for profit later, right? Later in seconds or later in days. Uh, we dealt with a case where they found a security bug in October, a SQL injection, and they didn't exploit it until Christmas Eve because they wanted to make sure nobody was watching, right? So certainly in a situation like that, if, we, if you caught the bug, it, you know, that's plenty of time to fix it. If you can fix it in an automated fashion, then you're in good enough shape. You don't have to do it in 6.7 nanoseconds, you can do it in 6.7 seconds. When you have a lot more information about who the person is and what they've done. Um, another thing about AppSec that needs to get better is bug bounty. Uh, 
And by bug bounty, I really mean the bug bounty community, the people who are doing bug bounties. Um, they need to reform their communities before they go away. Who here has a company that participates in bug bounties? Yeah. It's kind of a pain in the ass, isn't it? Right. Um, so this is a snapshot of our dashboard just so you can see what our week was like. Um, so this top line here is 18. So we got 18 new bug bounty reports, 16 new bug bounty reports yesterday. Um, and then my people had to go through, check every individual one, triage, and the ones that were significant bugs go file bugs and then go follow up. We have two full-time people just doing bug bounty. Um, and one of the reasons we have to have two full-time, there's a couple reasons for that. One, people are really bad at reporting the bugs. Now, a lot of that's a language barrier for folks, and so we can't really blame them. We need, as an industry, to provide people the ability to report software bugs in software, not in English. Um, we have this great reporter who I think is Egyptian, this Egyptian kid, who just records his whole thing in a video and then sends us the video, right? So he'll go exploit a bug and then pop up a, a, a notepad and say, thank you, sir. And I love this kid, and we keep on sending the money, and I'm really happy about it. Um, but realistically, he shouldn't have to go through that work. He should be able to write a little JavaScript proof of concept code, something that runs in Selenium, that then we can automatically run, and we can verify whether it's real or not. But the, the other problem is that the bug bounty community is full of schmucks. It's been polluted by horrible, horrible people who don't have any memory of what it used to be like. 15 years ago, if you found SQL injection and exploited it in a major web app, and got RCE, and then told the company what would happen. You'd go to jail, right? You'd have, if you were in a Western country, your door would get kicked in that day, and you'd be looking at years in jail. Now, if you're that guy, if you don't get paid in a week, you're whining and complaining on Twitter, right? Like, there's no recognition of, of what the rest of us had to do growing up, all of us old guys. Here I am shaking my virtual cane at these kids. <laughs> Go through in the security research community of years and years of it not being allowed to do security research in the web app world, it being illegal by default. And we could very well get there again, right? We're in this tiny little window where, as a company, we say you're allowed to, to hack us and, and send us bugs. But the law could change that we don't have that ability anymore. It's certainly not set in stone that we have that ability. Even now, it's a little bit sketchy. It's quite possible a U.S. attorney who wants to be a jerk could use a bug that's filed with us to prosecute a bug bounty reporter, even if we didn't cooperate. That's not our call, you know, um, if they believe they violated the CFAA. And with the CFAA changes the Obama administration's proposed, certainly that could become a significant problem. Um, but the, the bug bounty community needs to understand that their whole business model of I get to find bugs and then basically blackmail somebody with the bug used to be illegal, and it could be illegal again. And they need to have a little bit of humility, and they also need to be careful to, to, to not double dip. And we deal a lot with bug bounty reporters that like to get paid $8,000, $10,000, and then go get famous on it. And you can't have both. Either you participate in the bug bounty world, and you get your money, and you're happy with it, or you can go find a bug, and you, go, you can go give a big talk about it. But to try to do both at the same time means that companies are not going to be able to do this anymore. Um, and partly this is a media problem, that the media likes to write stories, like big company pays somebody to find bug and bug gets fixed, and so they, they literally write a story about that, um, which is a little bit ridiculous. And if we get to the point where that creates legal and PR liability for companies, then bug bounties are going to go away. Certainly bug bounties that they are right now are not going to expand past the biggest tech companies that have two, three people to spend all day doing bug bounty, and then have the ability to convince their legal and PR teams that it's worthwhile. Um, and so, you know, this is partially the bug bounty companies, but a lot of it's really the community. You, the community needs to stop being jerks. They need, to, they need to stop, you know, running scanners and spamming bug bounty uh, submission queues with automatically found bugs. It's like, yes, we have SQL map too. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for running it from your, from your AWS micro uh, instance. We had no ability to do that. Um, <laughs> we really appreciate the incredible amount of work you did to autofile that bug and to break the captcha in Hacker One, so you can file 500 bugs of fault, you know, 498 of which are false positives, right? So like that kind of stuff has to stop if we want bug bounty to survive, and we don't want these people to start going to jail again, which I think would be a bad thing. It'd be bad for the companies, it'd be bad for the researchers um, if this went away. Um, we need to, as an industry, accept that the browser is the new OS. Um, that you know, you, we need to get to the point of where we trust the isolation mechanisms in web browsers as much as we trust those in the, in the OS, which should be pretty easy. Like, my map right there, um, thanks. Anybody here work at Google Project Zero? Thanks to your guys' slavish devotion to your dis you know, responsible disclosure policy, uh, I don't have any ability to patch my laptop for two local privilege escalation uh, exploits. 
uh, right now. Um, so that's another issue. Uh, but you know, obviously OSs have already have like a real process iso uh, security isolation problem, and we need to get browsers to the point where we can trust them even more. Um, uh, Tom Patrick uh, wrote a very good article called JavaScript Cryptography Considered Harmful years ago uh, from Anasano. And unfortunately, this is the kind of thing where he made some very good points that are now twisted into preventing people from progressing in this area. Um, and you know, the points he made here that I don't want to go into detail are all legitimate, but they're all also fixable things. And realistically, we can't just opt out as an industry and say people can be secure if we're able to run binary code on their OS. Um, because one, that's a really hard distribution problem. Two, you have to you have to support lots of OSs. Three, it's not actually secure to train people that to be safe, you have to you have to put binary code. Um, and so for things like end-to-end -end cryptography, we have to get to the point where we can do it in the browser and do it safely enough that we're adding value and that we're not lying to the users about it. Um, but we need to stop citing this article is why we shouldn't, right? Um, and, and, and people need to stop saying, like, you can't do anything secure in the browser. Maybe that's true, then we have to change the browsers and how they work. And there's a lot of people doing that, uh, you know, through the web crypto APIs and other work in W3C. Um, the Chrome team's done a lot of work. The Firefox team's doing a lot of work. Can't say so much for the other browser guys, but hopefully they'll follow along uh, about making it so that you can do important things in the browser securely. Um, Network security uh, functions need to be transparent to applications. Who here has works at a company where your DNS root is signed by DNSSEC? Anybody here work at VeriSign? Anybody here work for the government? That's it. Okay, so nobody else here has DNSSEC then, uh, basically. That, that, that's it. Um, DNSSEC is dead. It's over. I'm just telling you now, it's over. Don't put any of your future stock on Dane or any security solutions that are based on DNSSEC. It's done. It's done for a couple of reasons. One, it's ridiculously complex. Um, you can go dnsviz.net, and it does a, it's a, a tool that VeriSign created where you can go visualize the DNSSEC signing uh, tree of all the different signatures. Um, this was a guy named JP Menz, I, I don't know his real name is on Twitter, posted, this is the current DNS uh, signing tree of, of some company, uh, he didn't say which one, uh, with DNSSEC. And you can see like all of these crazy arrows, like everything's cross-signed and stuff. Because this is what it looks like to try to roll over a key to try to do key rotation in DNSSEC. It's a complete and total mess. Um, this also causes a huge performance issue, right? DNSSEC is one of the reasons why DDoS, uh, DNS amplification attacks work so well, because now you can send an unauthenticated UDP packet and get a huge ass UDP packet in response. And you can bounce that attack off of the root servers that VeriSign uh, spent all this money to build and then use it to nuke almost any company off the planet. Um, you know, that's how the, the amplification attacks against Cloudflare and such happened. DNSSEC makes a, gives you a much bigger multiplier because the packet sizes are much larger. Um, another problem with DNSSEC, it's not end-to-end, -end, right? So the DNSSEC standard allows your DNS server to do the verification for you, not you. So who here, so like my default DNS provider is Comcast. Who here thinks I'm going to trust Comcast with anything? Like, yeah. These are the people who like, you know, will be there between 8 a.m. and 12 p.m., or 12 a.m. the next day, right? Um, who want to crap, you know, crap all over all of my, uh, do all kinds of nasty stuff to my packets. And I'm supposed to outsource to them the verification of DNS records. <coughs> no, that's not going to happen. So the non-ended nature was supposed to make deployment easier, but in the end we can't trust it. Um, certainly post Snowden, nobody's going to trust an ISP with doing their crypto for them. Um, but I think one of the largest problems with DNSSEC is it's invisible to user applications. So if you write code, on top of a commodity OS, it's almost impossible to find out just by asking, you know, if you just do a normal uh, A2I or something like that, to find out whether or not something was DNSSEC signed. To do DNSSEC in the application layer, you have to build your own resolver, and you have to do all your own DNS resolving yourself, which is kind of, kind of crazy. Um, and this was never really meant to be exposed to user applications, and if it's not exposed to a user app, then it's not exposed to the user, right? Um, and so any security precaution like this in the future has to be done end-to-end -end into the application code. It, you know, the OS can provide help, but in the end, the security decisions have to be made by applications. They can't be made by, by OSs. Um, we need to build apps that are safe, not just secure. Um, so you know, there's way too little focus of user experience. Kind of the classic problem here is how SSL certificates work. Um, so uh, Adrian Porter Feltz talking tonight about what they're doing in Chrome. Um, you guys can't see it here, but uh, I've got the Chrome information about three different websites, all of which are quote-unquote encrypted. Uh, us at Yahoo with Symantec, which does not have a certificate transpar uh, transparency log. Um, 
CNIC, the Chinese National Network Information Center, um, and DigiCert's uh, experimental significant transparency log server. Um, and there's like, this is obviously, for a lot of reasons, much less reliable, and there, that is understandable in the text, and you can tell a little bit graphically, but honestly, the words are not, they don't mean anything. All the, the right words are there, but they don't really mean that much. Um, this is pretty good, but the difference between here and here is like three words, uh, whether or not these guys are doing CT or not. And realistically, that means a lot if you're afraid of a government-level attacker, right? And so we, we have a kind of a continuous problem with doing this. Um, safe means that, by default, the safest mode is on, so that you don't have to go flip any bits to make a product safe. It means it fixes itself. So this isn't only me patching, but from a config perspective. If your application needs to change something to be safe, it has to do it by itself without prompting you. Um, and the fact that Microsoft doesn't auto-patch itself, Windows doesn't auto-patch itself, is one of the basic errors of the 1990s uh, that we're living with you know, for the next 20, 30 years. Um, it needs to fail gracefully instead of failing insecurely immediately, and that means also failing gracefully when there's a client-side security issue, right? So if you're building an app where you assume that the person using your app is has a fully locked down secure system and that they have a full-time incident response person looking at memory forensics every day to make sure that machine hasn't been taken over, and if that's not true, that person's totally screwed, then you're not building a safe app, right? I know this sounds like, oh, it's not my fault if there's a security problem on the client side, Sure, it's not your fault, but that doesn't mean you don't have to deal with it. And that's partially, you, you know, if you want to build safe apps, you have to think about the difficulties your users actually face in the use. Um, at Yahoo, we have a big user experience lab, and I've been going in and watching people do it for, you know, they, they bring these normal users in, they make them, you know, they're like, here's a cookie, go use Yahoo Mail for a bit, and then you watch them and take notes through a, a one-way mirror. Um, and I've been going to some of those sessions, not specifically around security, just to understand what are normal users, right? Like, if you just pick a random person who uses your product, what kind of problems are they facing? And they are very different than you. They're very different than your parents, right? So stop using I built it for my parents, or you know, stop using my mom as an example, right? Also use your dad, so you can even out the gender a little bit, because honestly, my dad's got a lot more malware in his machine than my mom does. Um, we're, not gonna, uh, just, we're not gonna try to figure out why. Um, <laughs> but, but also your parents are not, you know, you know the parents of a, a full-time security professional are not probably representative of a user who's coming online for the first time in India via a smartphone, right? Um, or a user, in, you know, a user in Kenya that uses Safaricom uh, both as a currency uh, uh, transfer mechanism as well as a, a means of communication with their family, right? You need to think about how all of your users, not just like your American, Western educated, native English speaking users use the product and understand what difficulties they face and make it, try to make it safe in that circumstance. Um, and then the big thing is you gotta take into account the entire life cycle of the user. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, which means I'm, personally, I've become a security paternalist. So I used to be all about user choice until I saw what it's really like to be a user out there. And now I think it's time for the security industry to put on their 80s dad sweaters and just make decisions on behalf of the family, right? Um, it's fine for users to have choice. If they're smart enough to make a choice that makes them less safe, then they're smart enough to go into about flags or to find some config change or to load a grease monkey script to do it. Um, you know, so we're going to be shipping end-to-end -end encryption for mail. We're going to make all the choices for you, right? Like one of the biggest problems you have right now, if you install GPG, it's like, great, let's sit down and have a chat about your key generation. So I'm going to assume that you're Ron Revest himself, right? Or that you've been personally trained by Ron Revest. Uh, and now we're going to make decisions about key generation, what size your subkeys are, what, this and that and this and that. And very few people are actually qualified to go through that checklist and do it intelligently. We're going to have no checklist. We're just going to make the decisions for you. If you want to have that choice, then you go download another app that gives you all those choices. But realistically, you know, if you're aiming for people who have the ability to make those choices, then let them go write their own code. Your responsibility is to keep your normal user safe. And so stop thinking about choice and start thinking about being a security paternalist uh, if, you, if you really want to make things better. Uh, passwords are dead. Uh, so our experience is you know, we have intelligence guys that go out and buy every time there's a bad password dump. Our guys go buy it off the black market. And then we go run a big Hadoop job and we go crack those against our own password hashes. And we find 10 to 20% of them match, right? So we'll, we'll take, if it's a Gmail account, we'll strip off the Gmail and see if the first username is still a Yahoo user. And we'll do some transforms and stuff. And it turns out, obviously, as everybody in here knows, a ridiculous number of people use the same password on every single website in their lives. And so if they lose one password, they've lost their entire life. And so this is a big problem for us, right? Because now we go and we find that we have millions of users you know, after one of these password dumps happened, we have millions of users who 
who are insecure in an insecure state, and we have to reestablish trust with them. So the kind of things people have used are two-factor. There's SMS, which is kind of a lowest common denominator, at least in the Western world, that everybody should be able to get an SMS message. That's not always true in a lot of countries. Um, this has a problem being, it turns out to be extremely expensive. Um, you can talk, it could be over like 25 cents to send an SMS to certain countries. Uh, and if you're a web scale company, you have to operate everywhere. It's very unreliable. There's a big controversy of Yahoo cutting off a certain Middle Eastern country. And everybody was thinking like, everybody was saying stuff about, oh, they hate us, and it's politics, and this and that, and this and that. There was a like contract negotiation between that country's uh, telephone network and some other telephone network, and they weren't delivering SMS. It had nothing to do with us. It was just you couldn't get SMS into that country via our provider, right? Um, and so SMS is actually quite unreliable, uh, even in the US or in Western countries. And it's also very insecure, right? SMS uses the least secure communication channel available to your phone. It's total plain text. So not only is it available to your government, it's available to anybody that has like 800 bucks and the ability to download software for USRP, right? Like there's, there's no way somebody in this room doesn't have an NZ catcher right now. Right? Like, you want to raise your hand? Whoever here is trapping all of our phone data? Like, if you're in a room like this, you can't securely get an SMS message. Um, and certainly, you know, if you're in a situation like a democracy movement, like the Arab Spring, or democracy protesters in Hong Kong, then you, you are actually making your users less safe to use SMS. Um, there's a TOTP, the little type, you know, Google Authenticator stuff. This was kind of a hacky patch for two-factor auth. It's a horrible user experience. People don't know how to use it. People don't know how to back it up. And because it's an open standard, it also means that people are using all of these different apps to do it. And it's now known that there have been apps in certain app stores where there are authenticators where they send all the authentication information off to the bad guys, right? Just like all the free flashlight apps in the Android store are all grabbing your personal information to sell to ad networks. You know, uh, you have to be really careful what you use, uh, you know, because you, you don't have any control over the seeds you can control it. So where a lot of people are moving towards is the push notification model where you have an app controlled by that company Obviously, though, that requires the user to go download the app for that company, um, uh, which is a problem. Uh, you know, FIDO is hopefully going to solve some of this by allowing for centralized authentication that's secure in a way that TOTP isn't. Um, but uh, you know, that's still kind of a fantasy, a little bit of a cloud right now. Um, and the real problem is none of the two-factor auth mechanisms solve the account lifecycle management. Right. So you can have the most secure two-factor auth. But what do you do when somebody loses their phone and they're in a foreign country and they can't get access to their email to ask somebody for help? Like all kinds of crazy stuff happens to normal people where they lose control or they lose basically sync with the companies that they're working with. Um, and so you have to think about the entire lifecycle management and what kinds of things you're going to do if the worst case scenario happens. Because if you're operating where you have millions or hundreds of millions or billions of users, the worst case scenario are going to happen for people dozens of times a day. Um, and you have to have some way to keep those people safe. But you have to do so in a way that doesn't make everybody else less safe. So we have a lot of work to do uh, in AppSec. Um, we need to be able to build apps without any kind of layer three protections, right? So we're moving towards a world where application security people have to think about the fact that there's nothing in the network keeping them safe on a layer three basis, um, which is probably true right now. It's just good for us to kind of explicitly understand that there are no longer going to be security products there to keep us safe. We have to build apps that are safe on their own without a WAF in front of them, at least a physical WAF. Because if you're going to operate at scale in the future, it's just going to be impossible to buy devices that operate at that speed. Um, we have to start patching in our CI CD pipelines. So the AppSec world and the container world is now going to be also responsible for the security side of DevOps, the ops side. Um, and so that means changing how patching works from a, I, you know, I find the change window, I patch in place, I reset machines, uh, I either reset services or I reboot boxes, to a, we design our apps so that we can take half of them down, replace them, and then we take the other half down and replace them, which is a completely different way to do patching. And it can be way faster. If it's the day of that you're trying to figure that out, you're going to be in trouble. Um, we need to figure out how to encrypt people's data and still provide them value. And so this is an area where I feel like the practice has not caught up. There's all kinds of interesting research in multi-party computation and homomorphic encryption um, and different encryption types. You know, for the most part, any kind of encryption that you can do transforms on and not break it has some, some kind of security problem. But you know, things are so bad right now, I'm kind of willing to accept that. Right? So if, if we can get to the point of where the practice catches up and we can do good enough encryption that perhaps leaks information in certain circumstances, that allows us to take 
some kind of function that people are just used to and make it secure, then that's a win. You know, so for us, what we're dealing with right now is what do you do all the time in your mail inbox? What is one, one of the most common functions that you do in mail? Delete. Okay. How do you find email? Do you just scroll through it? You search, right? So how do you search across? If, if, if we're successful in the future, people have hundreds of thousands of encrypted in mails in their inbox, how do you search that, right? And so figuring out a way that you can do that that doesn't just push it all into the client um, is, is a difficult problem, but it's the kind of place where the practice can really catch up with what's happening in academia. Um, we need to make browsers more trustworthy than the OS, so there's very few people in this room that can do that, but there are some people in this room that work on this problem. Um, and then the rest of us that build apps need to keep the pressure on uh, that there's nothing that the browser should not support, right? So, you know, all the people who are whining about web crypto API, shut up. You know, the game's over. The, the future is everything important to people has to be able to happen in the browser, not in, in binaries. And so we, if there's problems right now, we need to fix those problems, not just complain about it. Um, which is good. I mean, this is good for AppSec because there's more work for us. This is going to continue to be a really interesting industry. The question is, can we solve some of these problems without selling product? Because in the end, when you talk about the, the Fortune, the 100 versus the 400, a lot of the problem is things aren't safe by default. They're not safe in an easy manner. And so just knowing you're in trouble is the first step to figuring out you have to buy a product. Um, and so while there's obviously no economic incentive for some people to solve a problem without making money, hopefully as an industry we can get better at solving this stuff basically without you having to ship stuff. And then my, my shameless pitch slides, I'm looking for a new director or senior director of product security um, to run our product security team. We have 1.3 million users and about 80 products. It's a very interesting product security challenge. Uh, drop me an email uh, if you're interested. I think I have like five minutes for questions. Um, yes, sir. Well, I mean, I think the market that's untapped is the all of the companies who are writing code right now who don't understand how bad it is, right? Some of them are buyers. I mean, there's a there's an opportunity to create buyers. I think in the people who don't know. Um, I, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm not sure how much money you can make off of that. I, I mean, part of the problem is is that if you don't have the staff, the right staff, you don't know how bad things are. Right? And that's part of my, my message here. Now, obviously, these guys get pen tests or they get, you know, external bug reports and stuff and they understand there's a problem. There's a difference between understanding, your, you know, there's a problem and then building a team that can actually solve it and then buy products to do so. Um, so I think there's an opportunity there, but I think it's for products that aren't actually sold as security products. They're products that make things better in some other way and then they just happen to make them more secure. If that makes sense. I think for the vast majority of companies out there, they don't buy a lot of security products because they don't have advanced enough teams to go decide whether or not those products actually work for them and then spend the money, but they do get a lot of benefit of buying things that just happen to have security as an advertised benefit, like Splunk, right? Splunk for a long time was not something people bought for security, it just happened to be kind of an emergent property of getting people getting all their logs together that they can find interesting security stuff. And so if you want to sell a security product, I would suggest you have an operational or performance or development lifecycle benefit and that security is just an add-on. Because honestly, like, all the security products in the world, one of the problems everybody has is you're all trying to sell to the banks, right? You're all trying to sell to the same nine people, right? Like David LaBianca and five other guys in New York. They're, and you're all asking me for his phone number, and I will not give it to you because he gets way too many phone calls, right? And, and you know, those people already have solutions for most of their areas, and then if you warp your product exactly for like what the banks need, then it's not going to be sellable to the rest of that scale, right? So I, I do think there's an opportunity, but you can't start with... I'm going to sell my web application security product to Goldman Sachs, and then I'm going to sell it to number 239 on the Fortune 500. So you give an example of a specific product or feature that that was that operational Right, so I mean, Splunk was my example. Uh, you know, that's now being replaced from a... So, like, the JavaScript stuff, that would have been an awesome opportunity, right? Like, that would have been... If, you know, if people want to make, like, commercial 
um, code frameworks that make it way easier to write your web apps and make them way prettier, and it just happens to be it gets run across ASCII, scripting, then that's great, right? That's how like SQL injection is slowly going away because people are parameterizing from a performance perspective. They don't know that things are getting more secure when they do it. It just happens to be kind of a functional benefit. Yes, sir. What's the biggest challenge facing Yahoo? The biggest challenge facing Yahoo. That's a great question. I mean, I think um, the biggest challenge, by far, the biggest challenge is user security. It's not people breaking into us. It's making our product safe for normal users. The death of the password paradigm and replacing it is by far the worst thing. Like, I have a constant Twitter feed in my tweet deck of the words Yahoo and hacked. And every day, people are saying my Yahoo account is hacked. And I'll go find a random sampling, and we'll go look, and we'll say, yep, we figured out Sally, her password was in the eBay dump or something like that, or some, you know, crappy little place. And we're, you know, this is where the bad guys came in, and, and they did it, and there's... In theory, nothing we can do. In practice, it means we need to rebuild how we interact with Sally so that she isn't using the same password everywhere. Um, and that if she loses her password, it's not a complete disaster. So yeah, by far, the password problem is my biggest problem. Yeah, Matt, did you? Uh, you mentioned your banking program and how you don't like people double dipping, getting the banking and also getting a write-up. Oh, yeah. The opposition to that. Because if you're getting paid to do something, that's paid research. And it's not in our economic benefit to pay people to make us look bad, right? And from a security team perspective, it's specifically a problem with PR and security teams. That The idea is like, wait, our security team is paying people to then blackmail us and creating a community of people that make us look bad and complain if we don't pay within X days. So if bug bounty is going to survive, it has to go away. It has to be if you get your money, then you, you take your star and your, your this guy got paid, and you don't go turn it into a DEFCON talk. Otherwise, it's going to go away, for sure. Yes, sir. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. There's no good... I mean, it's different for everybody. We're, we're moving towards a world where SMS in some cases and push notifications in others. Um, I think what will end up is like SMS won't work in some countries, and then you have to do push, but then in most places you have the option. And this is another problem with user security, is you need to build security for the 99% without making it less secure for the 1% of people who actually have like a major nation state threat, right? So we have to come up with solutions where if we apply it to everybody, we protect the 99% people where it's really just my password was stolen by malware or my password was hacked from another site and then you're going to use my account for spam versus democracy activists. Like we can't make the democracy, we can't, I, there's no number of democracy activists I'm willing to sacrifice to keep spammers out, right? And so you have to find kind of multi-tier solutions or you have to provide the solutions and then give people a choice and be honest about the choice. And doing that is not, not very easy. So yeah, unfortunately, that's what I'm saying is like, that's an area, like there's going to be all these talks about cross-site scripting and SQL injection and all kinds of individual web bugs. As an industry, we, we spend way too little time on the real problem, which is how do people authenticate themselves to us, and then how do we establish that life cycle? How does this human being re-establish control of their account if necessary? Which the answer might be they, they don't. Then you just have to build a product that they don't mind starting a new account starting from scratch. Which for us is a problem because nobody does it for mail. Nobody's okay with like, I'm going to lose 10 years of mail. Right. Yes, sir. That's a good question. How do we incentivize our developers to develop more secure apps? So it's kind of a work in progress. Um, we have I have my dedicated central people uh, who are attached to all of our major products. Uh, who work with them. We do bug scrubs every month. So we sit with the engineering management and we talk about these are the bugs we found through our own scanning. These are the bugs we found through bug bounty, these are the lessons we learned. Um, I, we're going to probably roll out like a security black belt kind of model. So Yahoo used to have what's called the local paranoids. Paranoids is just the name for my security team. Um, it doesn't mean anything other than it's kind of funny and it looks good on a t-shirt. Um, but it's been a name, the Yahoo paranoids have existed for like 20 years. Um, so it's, it's an a institutional name that, uh, that we've had for a very long time. Um, but we've had local paranoids, which are people who are full-time employees of that team but have security got some security training and they're responsible. We're going to move that to more of a kind of a black belt model where it's not you are or you aren't, but we have multiple levels of participation and then you get that, you know, you get internal recognition, that goes to your boss. We might have some 
uh, you know, money, but more about like something you put in your resume, right? So that when you're going and if you're looking for another job, you can say, I became a security brown belt, and that's something they can ask you about. Like, oh, I got training in web app security, and I got training in how our uh, code scanning works. And then realistically, I mean, when you operate at like the, the ratio we have, which is I have like 20 people in that team versus like 5,000 developers, what you have to do is you have to build, uh, you have to make sure that the basic platforms people are building are secure, and then you enforce their compliance to that platform through stack analysis. And so we have our own stack analysis tools that are not, we have a unified CI CD pipeline, and so we scan against that, and so it's like, hey, you just used, you just used a database without going through our standardized database layer. That's a problem. Either, you know, you need to fix it. Um, but realistically, you know, it is, that's, that's a huge challenge. Great, that's it. I'll be around if you guys want to chat. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, I'm not going to post the slides because I was not able to find copyright. Our brand manager people are all about not getting sued for copyright infringement. Um, and some of those pictures are not Creative Commons. Um, so if you ask me individually like for a slide, I can send it to you, but I, I can't just put it up. So that's the downside of working for a company that actually has money. Um, that kind of stuff. Okay, we have a half an hour break, and then there are four sessions, one of them in this room and the three others. Uh, make sure that you visit our vendors under the tent downstairs. Without the vendors, you wouldn't be here today. And